Ya Rabbi Awal InsyaAllah Alhamdulillah 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 hey, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Fi kuli lahazatin abada abda ni'amillahi wa barihi Allahumma atina min ladunka rahmah Wa alimna min ladunka ilmah Subhanaka la ilma lana Illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Nawayna ta'alluma wa ta'alim wa tazakura wa tazkir wa naf'a wa nintifa' Wa rifada wa ristifada wa lhatta ala tamasuki Bi kitabillahi wa sunnati rasulihi sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Wa du'a ila al-huda wa dalalah al-khair Ibtilga'a wajhillah wa mardatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi سبحانه وتعالى مع نطف وعافية برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إن نسلك العالم لدني مشرب السوف الهاني وهاب يا غني اللهم إن نسلك العالم لدني مشرب السوف الهاني يا وهاب يا غني اللهم إن نسلك العالم لدني والمشرب السوف الهاني يا وهاب يا غني اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم الهمنا علما نفقه به اوامرك ونواهيك وارزقنا فهما نعرف به كيف نناجيك يا رحم الراحم اللهم إنا نسألك فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين وإلهام الملائكة المقربين في عافية يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أغننا بالعلم وزينا بالحلم وأكرمنا بالتقوى وجملنا بالعافية يا أرحم الراحمين آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم إنا نستودعك ما قرأناه وما نقرأه في هذا المجلس وما قبله وما بعده فاحفظه علينا حتى ترده إلينا وقت احتياجنا إليه يا أرحم الراحم اللهم يا معلم إبراهيم علمنا ويا مفهم سليمان فهمنا ويا مؤتي داود الحكمة آتينا الحكمة وأصلحنا اللهم أكرمنا بالنور الفهم وأخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وافتح لنا أباب رحمتك وانشر علينا حكمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم يا من مقل الأمور كلها بيده وإليه رجل الأمر كله يا فتاح يا عليم يا فتاح يا عليم يا فتاح يا عليم افتح علينا فتحا قريبا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقل من لساني يفقه قولي وسد لساني وهد قلبي وفعل كذلك بأحبابي أبدا وارزقنا كمال فتوح العارفين والفقه في الدين مع كمال الإخص والصدق واليقين والعافية والغنى والنصر والحفظ والنفع والانتفاع وخير تدارين وعلوم الأولين والآخرين آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا السراق المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمد عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولو ضالين آمين 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله في صلاة سبحان الله تعالى for gathering us again الحمد لله face to face الحمد لله to around his book سبحان الله تعالى and the people of the Quran they are the elect of Allah سبحان الله تعالى we ask Allah سبحان الله تعالى to make us to count us as the people of the Quran or at least of those who love the people of the Quran as we have as what we are studying here is the seer and these are the words of our scholars where which 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 derive their uh, who derive their knowledge all the way back to the, to the Prophet So at least if you can't be, uh, you know, the, the people themselves, the people of the Quran, it's a big claim right, to make. Uh, at least be those who love, right, those who love the Quran. Uh, be of those who love of those, those who love those who love the Quran. No, Allah. 
Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And we're continuing with the story. Now, uh, last week I, I, I read through the verses, right? And I went through briefly on the superficial meanings of the verses. And I went into the first part right, of the verses, which was the people selling off Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. So today, we're going right into the story of uh, Zulaikha. And it's known that her name was Zulaikha, the, uh, the wife of the Aziz, right, the wife of the minister. Her name was Zulaikha. And so here you see Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, and again with the sunnah of life, <laughs> the sunnah meaning the way of life. Right, it is Allah's way in the creation that uh, as long as you're on the face of this earth, it will be issue after issue after issue. <laughs> I just thought that like, he, just, he just went through a terrible thing with his brothers. Just finished the entire thing, got, got caught and sold into slavery. And then now, okay, you might think he's, he can rest now in the house of a rich man. But no, the wife got interested in him. <laughs> I mean, like, you will not think of all things to happen <laughs> at this point in time. That the wife now is infatuated like, with, uh, with a person. And this is, one of, this is, in fact, the biggest trial on Nabi Yusuf, alayhi salam, as will be the biggest trial on any human being. A trial in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you see the previous trials, right? The, the one of his brothers, right? He has had, it was a calamity that afflicted him. He kind of had no choice, right? In the sense that he was taken and he was thrown. Right? He didn't, like he was a young boy, he couldn't fight back. And there was basically, basically it was a calamity that afflicted and basically it, it encompassed him, right? And so all he had to do was be patient. Right? Be patient until, until the whole thing blows over as how we know, you know, certain things in life are like that, right? They just happen. And you have no way out, so no way around this, but just to go through the motions right, until it's done. Right? And then it, it finishes, it ends. And you know, you know, you know, you know brighter days will come, will come after that. This is this kind of calamity. It's a calamity of choice. Right? And it's a calamity on the iman. It's a calamity. It's a, it's a trial. Trial and a calamity on the iman because now he's faced with maxia. He's faced with sin. It's not like all the other calamities. All the other calamities in, in prison was easier. Right? He, said, he said himself, prison is, prison is easier and more beloved to me. Right? Being in charge of the wealth of the nation right, was easier. Right? Being thrown in the well by the brothers was easier. All of this was easier than this one calamity face to face with sin. What does he do? Subhanallah. And this was, this was this is one of the seven people under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when faced with sin. Right? They, they, right now, they have a choice. Right? Do they want to do it just one time? That's what Shaitan will tell you. <laughs> just one time. It's just one time. <laughs> then I don't want the brothers say what the brothers are like. It's just going to get, get rid of him one time. Then we're going to be all righteous. Just one act. Just one act. And subhanallah, what stops a man, eh? what stops a person, it is a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of the seven people under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of them is a man, a woman of beauty and, 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 uh, and position in society, call him uh, towards what is sinful, and he says, I fear Allah. And this hadith, of course, goes for both genders. As if a woman is called by a man, I to do what is sinful and she refrains saying I fear Allah or even in any way or form it doesn't have to be a sexual uh, sin it can be any form of sin I say so someone calls you to cheat and to do some, some business that, that, is, that, that involves cheating that involves lying or any kind of, of, of those any kind of sin and, but you, and, and it's so tempting because the money is, is, is a lot and the money sometimes in this kind of things the money, the money is, is tempting but you say no I fear Allah. I, I rather stick with whatever I know, which is minimal but halal, I, than to go into what is haram. I, so this is a, a calamity, and we're going to go into the, 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 the analysis. As Allah says about the story of Nabi Yusuf, therefore surely in the story of Nabi Yusuf, ah, uh, it's, they, they, they are signs for those who ask questions. And just ask questions. Eh? Right, so, وَقَالَ الَّذِي اشْتَرَاهُ مِن مِصْرَ لِمْرَأَتِهِ Right. And said the one who bought him from Egypt. So now the Quran tells us clearly this scene is happening in Egypt. Right. So it's from the Quran itself, it is in Egypt. Right. Which is why it's how the Bani Israel ended up in Egypt. Right. Because they were all in Palestine. Right. They were all in Palestine at Canaan, 
when Nabi Yaqub was. So Nabi Ibrahim, Nabi Ibrahim is in Palestine. Nabi Ibrahim has his son Nabi Yaqub in Palestine. Nabi Yaqub has his son Nabi Nabi uh, sorry, Nabi, Nabi, Nabi has his son Nabi Ishaq. Nabi Ishaq in Palestine. Nabi Ishaq has his son Nabi Yaqub in Palestine. Nabi Yaqub had his twelve sons. Right? Nabi Yusuf was the one who was brought to Egypt. Then later at the end of the story, he invites his entire family to Egypt. And for that reason, the, the Bani Israel were in Egypt, and that was Nabi Musa, alayhi salam, because they did their descendants. Right? So they, they stayed in Egypt and they populated uh, Egypt. Right? But uh, along the way, the Egyptians began to place themselves as a superior race over the Bani Israel, and they began to enslave the Bani Israel. Israel is the name of Nabi Yaqub, alayhi salam, the children of Yaqub. Right? They became the descendants of Nabi Yaqub. So they enslaved them in the time of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, we see them in Egypt enslaved. Right? Then they, they run off. Right? They run off to Nabi Musa and they go back to uh, Palestine. Right? But when they, before they go back to Palestine, the story of Nabi Musa is that they were banished right, from the land because they were told, enter Palestine safe you know, and, and protected you know, in belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they said to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, Oh Musa, there are some tyrants in there. How about you and your God go and fight? <laughs> and we sit here. When you're done, come tell us. And we enter. So by that, Allah was so angry with them. Allah banished them right, in the land for 40 years. For 40 years, banished. And banished meaning they would walk in the land. Then they would sleep for the night. And they would wake up at where they began. For 40 years, it happened to them. The Bani Israel eh? for 40 years. So which is why after 40 years, the, 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 the community of people who, who were that rude to Nabi Musa, in these 40 years, Nabi Musa passes away. Nabi Musa passes away, Nabi Harun passes away. Right? In fact, the entire, the entire um, generation, they pass away. The children take over right? after 40 years and they regret what their forefathers did because they were born into that. Right, in, into that situation. So they Taubat and then under the, the hands of uh, Yusha bin Nun, he's one of the um, Nabi but not Rasul. The Nabi but not Rasul. And, uh, he led them into Palestine and they eventually went to Palestine eventually. And so anyway, so this is how they actually ended up in Egypt. Right, because Nabi Yusuf was brought to Egypt and he brought his family to, uh, to Egypt. And he to his wife, Akrimi Maswahu. Right, so it's not as uh, we mentioned before when we were going through the meanings. Right, it's not a common thing to say about a slave boy. Right? You won't come and say to your, to, you know, to the man of the house, honor his living space. You know, not, not people will not do that. Yeah, subhanallah. Right, so, so this shows that the Aziz he had an idea of how special Nabi Yusuf was. Alayhi salam. Asa an yamfa'na aw nattakhidahu walada. And Allah reminds us, it is Allah who gave Nabi Yusuf position. That it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who caused all these calamities to afflict Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. All the tests to Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. And for those looking into the story, because it's, it's narrated in the Quran, for those to the end of time to take lessons. Like what about this story? And because stories in the Quran are not for fun, <laughs> they're not for, for like, you know, information or entertainment. Eh? Stories in the Quran, they, they are brought in an angle for you to take the lessons that Allah wants you, that Allah wants you to take from, this, from the stories in the Quran. So you see, the, the, the Quran it, it does not go by the beginning and end of the end. No, the Quran, except for the Yusuf story, is the only one story that begins with the beginning and ends with the end. And whereas the other prophets, like you have clips here and there around the Quran. Right? Why? Because Allah is speaking about a point in the Quran, then to illustrate the point, story. Uh, so, 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 so telling people about taqwa, okay, story. Uh, telling people about choice, okay, story. Right? And that helps human beings. You know, if you're teaching, if you're teaching you know, um, um, morality, the, the strongest way to deliver your point is to tell a story. People remember the story straight away. The Quran does it a lot, eh, mashallah. Surah Yusuf is, is, is a unique surah. <laughs> From start to end, it's one story. Naam. Aw nattakhidahu walada. Wa kazalika makanna li Yusuf. Allah is the one who is doing this. Fil ardi walinu'allimahu min ta'weelil ahadith. And Allah says, Allah has taught Nabi Yusuf the interpretation of dreams. And interpretations of dreams. Ahadith means events. It means dreams. So, 
Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi walakinna aktsara an-nas la ya'lamun and Allah is predominant ghalib yani Allah is in charge and yani Allah is in charge of his affairs even though most people do not know and he of Egypt who purchased him said to his wife receive him honorably i honor this boy i perhaps he might be useful to us because he's you know a special person I said that there's a bright future for this boy and we might take him as a son because they have, they have no children and thus Allah established Yusuf in the land by placing Nabi Yusuf in the hands of the Aziz right? the, the minister he's in the hands of the minister but, but being in the hands of the minister did not do anything for him being seduced by the minister's wife put him in jail which put him in a position right, whereby he was answering questions right? he was doing that while in jail which later on put him in a position to be the king's advisor. Right? So all this is like, like one, one after another uh, being the cause of, of another thing. So we never, you, can never, you can never underestimate the events in your life. Right? You might think, what, terrible, what a terrible calamity being thrown in the well. What a terrible calamity being seduced by a woman. What a terrible calamity being accused by all these women. Right? Because, because the women who later on came come into the picture, they're all wives of ministers. Eh? All of them are aristocratic women. <laughs> they're, very, they're on the highest um, strata in society. All of them were amazed by Nabi Yusuf. Which is why it's on the, in the Quran Allah says, the, the husbands, the ministers came together and they all decided to put him in jail. <laughs> just, just <laughs> because the wives, were, the wives were talking about Nabi Yusuf all the time. They couldn't get over the beauty of and the, 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 the good looks of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And but most people do not know that Allah is in complete, is in complete control. And so do not forget, and last week we mentioned about our aqidah, and that whatever afflicts you in life, embrace it. Embrace all afflictions. It's all part of Allah's plans. All that is on you is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah never, never place it on you, your, your own destiny and your own decree. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's affair. And Allah handles your rizqi, Allah handles your decree, Allah handles your everything about you. All that he put on your shoulders is obey him. That's all. Just obey him. <laughs> That's all he's asking. And even then, we can be worried about all these other things and then obedience put to the side. So Imam Ghazali says, the distractions of this life. Imam Ghazali in, the, in his book, Minajil Abidin, he speaks about the four distractions in life. And because his life is, Allah says, life is for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are distracted. Distracted by what? Distracted by their rizq that Allah has already confirmed for you. And distracted by their fears. They have all these worries and fears. Distracted. They are distracted by their decree. I, that all these things has happened is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are distracted by calamity that they, 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 they go into a, like a rut and they can't come out of when what is placed on them is worship that's all, obedience that's all that's placed on you everything else, let Allah handle and Allah handles it anyway Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi and Allah is, is, is in control over your life, whether or not you realize it, eh? and whether or not you want to submit to it, Allah is in control. So just relax. <laughs> Allah is in control. Let Allah do whatever He wants to do. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are a slave right, in the hands of your Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But most people don't understand or they don't know. So here, the wife who brought him to his wife, he was a man from Egypt, was a minister from Egypt. Uh, according to Sayyidina Abdullah bin, bin Mas'ud, uh, he was the, uh, the companion of Rasulullah Wasallam. The Aziz of Misr inferred the inner beauty of Nabi Yusuf from his external beauty. Uh, so he, he could recognize, Nabi Yusuf was still a boy at this time, 12 years old, or some say 12, 11, 12 around there. Uh, so it, um, he, he was already a very beautiful young boy. <laughs> Uh, so he, was, he was very attractive as a young boy. Um, and so he inferred that, he, that Nabi Yusuf had good character uh, from the external beauty of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, um, and, and true enough, right, it was also with, with him interacting with Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, he saw Nabi Yusuf had good character. There is a hadith 
Rabbi Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Allah does not bring together two traits in a believer I to fling the person into the hellfire. These two traits is a beautiful outward and a beautiful inward. I, Allah, if Allah gives you a beautiful outward and a beautiful inward, and a beautiful outward is is, is a vast meaning. Eh? <laughs> beautiful outward. I don't let you know the media just define for you what is a beautiful outward because Allah's creation is beautiful. Subhanahu wa taala. Allah has perfected His creation. He Himself has said so. He has perfected His creation. What remains in its natural form that is beautiful. That's how Allah has created it. And we are the ones who distort the natural form. And we are the ones who try to do something else to the natural form. And then we think we are making it more beautiful. But Allah So many times, if you see someone in their natural form, so beautiful, mashallah. I look at children, so you hardly find an ugly child. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever seen a, an ugly baby. Yeah? I think every baby I've ever seen is beautiful. Every single one. <laughs> Allah created them right, the way they are. And then a beautiful inward, a beautiful character. Allah has given that to you. Alhamdulillah. It's, good, it's, a, it's a sign. It's good news. It's a sign that Allah wants a paradise for you. And so inward is for you to work on. Right? Outward is for you to appreciate. And not to try and find fault with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is, it is kufur ni'mah. It is, it is to deny Allah's blessings. To, to be discontent with how you are created. To deny His blessings. And who is to say what's beautiful, what's not beautiful, right? <laughs> Subhanallah. So Nabi Yusuf's story, which is why, mashallah, with the Nabi Yusuf's, um, uh, the, 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 the surah of, surah of, of Nabi Yusuf, alayhi salam, they will say for pregnant women to read this surah right, in, in abundance as you are pregnant, to read. There are, there are a few surahs to read when you are pregnant, right? And this is one of the surahs uh, for good, for beautiful character, not so much for the good looks. <laughs> Uh, it's more important, beautiful character. Uh, good looks for what? If you're gonna be burning, if, if someone's gonna burn the hellfire, uh, for what? Good looks. <laughs> Can, how many people have, have have amazing looks, and then only to, to to flaunt their looks and to flaunt their body and to flaunt all kinds of things, and then and then not to have any devotion to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But the reading of Surah Yusuf while being pregnant, it is the intention to have for the child to have beautiful character. And that is the, the intention. One of my friends, she didn't, she didn't read Surah Yusuf at all when she was pregnant. Because she didn't want her child to be beautiful. She said, it's a big fitna. You know? <laughs> because she was, she was very beautiful. She was very, a very beautiful woman. Right? So she, she felt too much attention coming to her. So she didn't want her child to receive it. <laughs> so she didn't read Surah Yusuf. And I said, Yusuf is for character. La. <laughs> Not for, for looks. And no one told me. I thought it was for looks. <laughs> Because Nabi Yusuf is known for his handsomeness. How can Nabi Yusuf known for his, for his good character? <laughs> he has excellent character. But he's all known by, by the woman who cut their hands when they saw him. <laughs> That's the most famous story of Nabi Yusuf. <laughs> Why? He went through so much. And then, if, 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 can you imagine Nabi Yusuf? All you remember is the woman and they cut their red fingers. All my whole life that I went through. <laughs> all you remember is the woman and their fingers. <laughs> Nabi Yusuf, mashallah. Beautiful character that the, the Aziz of Mesir saw right, in Nabi Yusuf, he could see light shining in the face of Nabi Yusuf salam, as with all prophets. All prophets have a shining, they have, they have light in their face. And all people who carry the, geneo, the genes of prophets, right, they carry the, the, the loins, eh, the genes of prophets, they also have a shining light in their face. And this was, this was documented, clearly documented in the lineage of Rasulullah His father had a light in his face. His grandfather had a light in his face. His mother, while pregnant with him, had a light in her face. And all of them right, had, have lights in their faces. They're prophets. You all don't live amongst prophets, so you don't know that like, you, know, you can spot a prophet from, from afar. Eh? One prophet. <laughs> Imagine how in the past, when they lived amongst prophets, and, and to, actually, to actually witness a prophet in your midst, <laughs> mashallah. Right, so he saw this boy of high standing and loved him immediately, as with all prophets. All prophets are attractive. All prophets have a beautiful light. All prophets uh, they gain love immediately from the people around them. That is what Allah has bestowed on His prophets. Why? Because they have to da'wah. Right. 
So because it's a da'wah, the, what, you, what Allah would give his prophets will be complete attraction. Right? People will come to him from all, come, come to them and follow them. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sina Aisha radiallahu anha, she, when she read the story of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam in the Quran and about the woman who cut their fingers, say again, about this woman who cut their fingers, she said that if the woman of Yusuf had seen my Muhammad, you know, my husband, Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would have cut out their hearts out of how gorgeous he is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in, in, in the Rasulullah Sallallahu said that Yusuf was given half of beauty and I am given the full of beauty. And also, he said that, but most of my beauty is hidden. Because people cannot function. <laughs> Already, Nabi Yusuf cannot function. <laughs> and Nabi, Nabi, Nabi Muhammad, how to function? <laughs> like go into, you know, there was once a man that came into his presence, suddenly, la, suddenly saw, saw Rasulullah, and he has a presence. Nabi Muhammad, a haiba, in Arabic, they call it haiba. Uh, the Malay word haiba. Right, it's the same. It is, I'm, not, I'm not joking. It's the same way. The Malays took the word haiba. Right, haiba meaning hebat. Right, he's hebat. Right, yes, there's a greatness about him. A man came in suddenly into Rasulullah's presence right, and then he went to shake. Right, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't control himself because it was so, like, so awesome <laughs> of a human being. Right, and then Rasulullah had to went close to him and said to him, Calm down. <laughs> right, Calm down. I'm just a man. I'm just a man, you know, whose um, mothers or grandmothers had eaten dried meat. I mean that, you know, I'm from I'm from a poor lineage. I'm like any one of you guys, right? In a sense, you know, he was you know humbling himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he is the greatest of human beings. But I was trying to comfort the person. <laughs> don't don't panic. Eh? Don't 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 stand like that. You're going to like some sort of like you know um, what they call it. Like uh, starstruck, <laughs> starstruck, so oh, amazed by Rasulullah. Same thing happened to Rasulullah's uh, grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Uh, when he came into the presence of Abraha, who was going to destroy the Kaaba, when Abdul Muttalib came into the presence of Abraha, Abraha got off his throne. <laughs> and he's the king who was about to destroy the Kaaba. He got off his throne and he was shaking, seeing the greatness of Abdul Muttalib in front of him. The grandfather, this is the grandfather of Rasulullah. So Nabi Yusuf, same thing, prophets, they have this, he's a young boy, right? but there is this awesomeness about them that is unique for prophets. Unique for prophets, inshallah. Literally, the minister said, be generous in his place of abode, be generous to him. All this is meant to be an instruction to treat him kindly. The expression signifies greatest kindness to be contrasted with his stay in the uh, to be contrasted with his stay in the well right so it does it does have a have a meaning there right? about to be to be to be good to him he's gone through a lot right to be good to him he's gone through a lot right? and all the fears that were associated with that experience of being in the well not to say the minister knew about the well story right? not to say but the minister could tell that nabi yusuf was a boy who had gone through a lot right? he could tell right? so with the greatest nabi yusuf and the light in his face he could still tell it was a boy who was, um, he's not a slave. The minister knew he was, because the slaves, they have a, they have a, they have a way about them. Right? Someone who's not a slave, right? meaning someone from a, from a, from a higher uh, class of society, they can tell. They can tell that you're from a noble family. They can tell from the way the person carries. Of course, Nabi Yusuf would be light in his face. <laughs> prophet, like he, he's a prophet. And so, of course, they could tell he's not a slave. And he's been, basically, basically they, they knew he was being, he's been kidnapped. And he's been uh, abducted. Same thing with um, many of the, mashallah, even if Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam, his, uh, his adopted son, Zanazib bin Haritha. And they could tell he wasn't a slave. And he was actually kidnapped right, from his family and sold into slavery. Which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed him right, from his slavery, but he chose to stay with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam instead of going back to his family. Inshallah, and he instructed his wife to do to do so, not anybody else. This shows the situation of Nabi Yusuf with the Aziz. So not any other slave or any other uh, servant. His own wife, right, he said, honor this young boy, this special boy that I bought from the market. Asa an yafana aw natakhidahu walada. Right, they had uh, so, so so basically this what this this basically the entire ayat right, showed how the Aziz viewed Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Wakadarika makanna Yusuf. Right, and just like that, Allah gave Yusuf position. 
and he gave position he, he gained position to the aziz because remember before the seduction story because while in the quran is one ayat apart right, in life it was a few years down the road right because he came in as a child and then allah says and when he reached his maturity i mean in puberty and some say up to his 30s i right, had different riwayat as to how old he was when he was seduced by the minister's wife right, so which means that he has lived in the house of the minister for good years uh, for a good number of years So it's only one ayat apart in the Quran, right? But the minister knows him well. Right? He's lived, and and the minister has loved him like a son. Right? So which is why Nabi Yusuf, when 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 the wife comes up to him, he said, "My my my lord," meaning his minister. He's been good to me. Right? I will not I will not uh, betray him in this way. Right? To remind her as well, your husband has been good to you. Right? Don't betray him in this way. Right? But she was she was. Um, قَدْ شَغَفَهَا حُبَّا In the Quran, Allah says, right, she, she was, she was uh, what is it, crazily in love. <laughs> right, right, I don't know how to say it. Like, شَغَفَهَا حُبَّا right, She was completely consumed by her obsession. She couldn't see anything at all. And that, that, is, what, um, that is what lust does. Right, lust can consume a person in their obsession. Allahumma sadi ala sayyidina Muhammad. There was once uh, uh, this kind of um, you know this kind of tilawa competitions uh, on TV. This kind of like they recite the Quran, and in Malaysia like, they always have it right. For I, the, I think few years ago I was watching it. My my mother and I put it on, and every the, the verses they they chose were exactly the verses of seduction in Nabi Yusuf's story, and so like those who understand, you keep sitting there and you're like. Like you know, wara wadat kulati huwa fi baitiha, and like you just every single participant, children, small children who were reciting, and the one who was in the house seduced him. That was the ayat. I'm thinking, the organizers of all ayats, can cari lah ayat lah ngada ayat. Why every small child wara wadat kulati huwa fi baitiha an nasihi. وغلقت الأبواب وقالت هاي تلك مسكم تومي. but it was not title. So it was not title. It was just lawa. So I think I was thinking there not not not. He said not a person who understands what being said. I was thinking there my 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 niece was from Marasa uh, Segov. She was I mean Piula. She was like mommy. Why did you choose this ayat? Because she understood. I just have no idea why every single small child is singing, is reading this ayat over and over again. Okay lah, Quran. Tapi kan Quran is 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 so many ayats in the Quran to choose for the competition. Not this one seduction ayat. Mana hal lah, mashaAllah. Okay, so so it's really mashaAllah. Um, um, um. You know when I tell the kids the story of Nabi Yusuf, I teach children. And I told them, I will say that the 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 wife of the minister, I wanted to do bad things. <laughs> they thought, what else can you say? They said the five, six, <laughs> do bad things. What bad things want to hurt Nabi Yusuf? Ah, and Nabi Yusuf said, no, I am afraid of Allah. <laughs> and Nabi Yusuf ran away from her. Dah lah, macam gitu eh. Children, nah, insya Allah. Allahumma sadi ala sadiyana Muhammad. I said um, so he brought in he was brought from far to be given a high station he was loved in a noble house for years and this has gone through for has happened as this is going on for years eh? he's established he is loved in the house the minister honors nabi yusuf he's not a slave in the house and he's an honorable person in the house this is a prediction that he will be given position and power the allah says وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَنَّا لِيُوسُفْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah says, Allah, Allah has given and will give Nabi Yusuf position on the earth. The Arabic can, can take two meanings. Eh? مَكَنَّا right? مَكَنَّا is a continual giving of, of position and power to Nabi Yusuf. Right? So Allah has given him, even though he's a slave, right, that his master honored him. <laughs> so he's not exactly a slave, only by name he's a slave. Right, but his master had honored him in the house, right? and then uh, later on, you know, he became a minister of finance right, in Egypt, and, then, and, and, he, and he held a very important position in a time of famine. <laughs> Subhanallah. Uh, and he knew, he was blessed with an environment where he could interpret dreams and events. He was established so he could bring peace through equity 
and justice for the betterment of community, Nabi Yusuf used his position to da'wah. And later on, and so later on when he became a minister, even in the even in the in the um, uh, apa, in the in the sijil, in the in the jail, right, he used his position. He was you see someone who's good is good wherever they go. So when he was thrown in the prison, right, the prison people automatically identified he's not supposed to be here. <laughs> right. Straight away they knew. They said, "Go for um, some frame case." <laughs> right. They saw him only. They know he's not. He's not one of us. <laughs> he's some. He's a, he's a very pure person. <laughs> Why is he in the in the cave in, 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 in the in the prison? And the same thing happened. This is Sunnah of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam to be thrown in prison. The same thing happened to so many of the scholars in the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, taking after Nabi Yusuf. Alayhi salam. Imam Shafi'i thrown in prison. Imam Malik thrown in prison. Imam Abu Hanifa thrown in prison. Imam uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal thrown in prison. <laughs> Every one of our great imams were thrown in prison right, by, the, by the government of that time. And when they were in prison, they made a madrasa in prison. <laughs> in prison they talked about all the jailbirds all talked about <laughs> right, at their hands. And all of them became alim after that. They all became scholars in their own rights and they were jailbirds. <laughs> you know, subhanAllah. Um, and, and like, uh, was the, 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 of, when you read the biography of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Shafi as well, when they were in prison, they established Jama'ah, Salat Jama'ah in the prison, and they called the guards to Salat with them. Everybody Salat <laughs> together. <laughs> this is what, you, what happens when you put imams in prisons. <laughs> they make their own school. <laughs> and with their own halakha, they teach hadith from their, from their memory. <laughs> and they teach Quran and hadith and whatsoever. And then everybody get, gathered around, and the people of the prison became educated. In the prison, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, when he was locked up in prison, you see, Nabi Yusuf same thing. He did, he did the same thing. In his prison, he converted the people, all to become monotheists. He he da'wah to them. Nabi Yusuf, Allahu So Nabi um, um, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was said that when he was thrown into prison, right, he began to teach the people hadith, <laughs> and some of the people became his long time students later on, and they were jailbirds. <laughs> they were jailbirds. It's a very beautiful story about Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal in prison. And I'll come back to this. Right, but Imam Ahmad, and it's basically Allah put him in prison. And while he was in prison, right, the, even the guards knew that he has been wronged. So the guards were on his side. Right, so they began to smuggle pieces of paper to Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal for him to write his book. <laughs> Or I'll smuggle something else. <laughs> and other human beings smuggle. <laughs> I don't know what they smuggle. But they were smuggling pieces of paper to Imam Ahmad for him to write his famous book, right, the, the, the collection of hadith. So it was as if Allah locked him up in prison, away from his duties as a teacher right, in, you know, in society, to write your book. <laughs> and his book till today. Till today, the, the collection of hadith, all from his, from his uh, memory, he did it in prison. Right, while he was locked up. But there's a story of Imam Ahmad in prison. I will mention that now, continue my, my, my class. Um, there was, basically he was thrown in the prison because he refused to uh, say the Quran was created. Right, that was the one thing. Right? Everybody else gave in to the government at the time right, who forced people to say the Quran was created. Imam Ahmad and only his friend, the two of them, they refused to say the Quran was created, his friend got killed. His friend actually got killed by the, the government. And then Imam Ahmad was thrown into prison because they needed him to say it because he was the Imam of the Ummah. Uh, so if he said, they need to keep him alive for him to say it. Uh, because they, 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 yeah. so, so basically, when he was in prison, he met with a highway robber. So, highway robber, highway robber. Uh, this kind of uh, bandits. <laughs> and it's called pirates, eh? highway robbers, eh? bandits. Right? So this bandit, right? he, says, he told Imam Ahmad, I've killed and I've plundered and I have stolen and, and, and destroyed and burned and done all kinds of things. Right? So, and, but this, this bandit becomes his close student <laughs> in, the, in the prison. So, so Imam Ahmad just, you know, one time he said to his, to his, to his um, student that, you know, he said that, that he's okay being in prison. He can still teach, writing his book. He has no issue. And he will never give into what they say. But he said he's afraid of the whipping. Because they were threatening him threatening to, to whip him, to whip his, his uh, back. And they whipped him until his skin split and he was bleeding down his back. I had to force him to say the Quran is, 
uh, created. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, the story of, of how Rasulullah actually told Imam Shafi'i to tell Imam Ahmad that he will be afflicted with a major affliction but remain strong, remain firm. Right? Because while he was being whipped, right, one of his students, one of the guards say, Oh Imam, just say it. Because the guards cannot tahan. They all love, they all, they all fell in love with the Imam in the, in the, in the jail. Because <laughs> he's all like them every day. <laughs> and he dawah and everything. So everybody in the jail, the guards all, all love the Imam <laughs> in the jail. And they were against their own government. Right? But then um, the guards said to Imam, Imam, just say the word. Just say. Like Ammar bin Yasin, in the time of Rasulullah, there was a Sahaba who actually said, you know, he said, or some is a liar, just to escape from Abu Jahl. Uh, it's permissible, it is permissible because to save your life. Uh, and, then he, and then he ran to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, I said this and said that. It's how do you find your heart? My heart is a believer, Ya Rasulullah. Then you are a believer. Uh, so one of the guards said to Imam Ahmad, Imam, just say the word. Just say it's created. You don't have to believe it. Just say it and you can escape. Then the Imam was like, you see all those people out there who are gathered, you know, around. Some of them will know I said it to get out of this torture. But there are going to be so many scribes who's going to write what I see. And it's going to go down in the history of Islam. And it's my name. Right? Imam Ahmad said this. And uh, after today, Imam Ahmad said it. Uh, it, holds, it holds weight. Right? Res- no, no, it's, there's, there's, there's scholarship responsibility right? in, a, in an Imam. You can't just say whatever you say. Right? People will, will write it down. So when he was in prison, and this bandit, you know, he said to the bandit like that, I fear the whipping. He said to the bandit, I fear the whipping. Because I fear I can't take the pain of whipping. He never felt whipping. I don't know how whipping feel like. And then the bandit said, Imam, I'll tell you one thing. When they caught me, you know, in my activities, like, when they caught me, they whipped me 50 times, Imam. 50 times. So he said, if I can, t- can stand 50 times whipping in the way of shaitan, you tell me you can't stand 50 times with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <laughs> so the Imam saw, let's say Allah sent him a, a message. Uh, you can take it. Take it. <laughs> so the Imam became like, 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 firm like, after the, the bandit didn't make advice. <laughs> I, in the way of shaitan, I can tahan 50 whips. You know, with Allah, so you can't tahan. <laughs> can someone say in the way of shaitan? <laughs> Hey, mashallah. But mashallah, this is um, the way of Nabi, uh, the, the, the Sunnah of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. He was thrown in prison and he did da'wah in prison. Right? As with all the great Imams, every single one of them thrown in prison and they did their own school in prison <laughs> while they were there. No, mashallah. Allahumma sari ala sayyidina Muhammad. So they knew. And they knew of this position of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Allah taught him how to put things right where they belong. He was the Nabi of his time. He was a Rasul of his time. He had a duty to uh, fulfill. He was blessed with comprehension of divine knowledge. He had wisdom. Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, as Allah said in the next verse, that Allah will give him knowledge and wisdom in his implementation of knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with Nabi Yusuf, you see, he is about to face the biggest uh, trial eh, against him. Allah prepared him with knowledge and with knowledge. But knowledge also together with fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Must fear Allah. So how many people out there have knowledge, 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 no fear? They become monsters. And knowledge without taqwa right, breeds a monster. But knowledge with taqwa breeds a saint. A, a, a wali of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Acquisition of all, of all other supportive knowledge and the interpretation of dreams. Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi. Allah is powerful and is in control of what He wills. Whenever He wills, all events will fall into place so that it will happen. Allah will not allow anyone to be in charge of the affairs of Nabi Yusuf, nor anybody in His creation. <laughs> Allah is in charge in everybody's affairs here. Yeah. Uh, from the beginning of time to the end of time, Allah is in full charge like, over whatever we go through. Nobody can take over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody's plans and plots will prevail. Do not fear human beings, but fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And rely in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So the Quran, the Quran does a lot of, you know, mentality shift. Eh? The Quran, mashallah. So Allah says most human beings don't know. Because most human beings think that they are in control of their own lives. You think you're in control of your own lives. Allah is in control. And depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So was it in there? Yes, tell me if I need to slow down. The bottom part, is it? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Walakin Akhtar Nasila Alamu and most people do not know the reality of most human beings. This means that there are a few who know and most human beings have their eyes on obvious causes. They don't see Allah in control. They see the dunya we causes. Right? The, the, the asbab. Right? The, dun, the, the causes in this dunya. So they don't see, like, you know, as what Imam Ghazali says, that you can, like, for a fisherman, he can be out at sea the whole day from morning to night. Does not mean he's going he's gonna to catch a, a lot of fish. Right? If Allah commands the fish to go into his net, he can catch a lot of fish in a, in a moment. All in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All Allah wants to see from us is effort. But Allah will give. So even if someone were to get wealth without any effort on their part, then they just lost out in, in gaining reward on a day of judgment. And Allah gives you money, Allah gives you this or that. With no effort on your part, then nothing for you on the day of judgment. <laughs> but if you work hard and you do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ibadah, and whether or not money comes into your hands, the whole point is trying to obey Allah. So you already won. You've already won. And without money coming into your hands, then you've already won by doing something that Allah has commanded. And the same thing with studying, studying religion. Whether you pass or you don't pass, <laughs> you're studying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you win right now. Right now, that win already. Whether you pass or not, you try, you try hard. And then there are those who don't study at all and they still they, they, they score very well. Then the reward minimal, right? It's minimal reward. Same thing with du'a, right? Someone who gets things just like that, without du'a, without kiamule, no night prayer, no yasin reading, no sedekah giving, no nothing all. Everything comes to them. Allah can do that. Allah gave Fir'aun everything, right? But then on the day of judgment, what are you gonna get? Can, okay. as opposed to someone that Allah withholds, doesn't give them. They do ah and do ah and they pray at night and they sit the car and then they read your scenes and then they, they do all of what they can do. Even if it, does not, if it never comes their way, even if it never comes their way, they've already won. Right? And the day of judgment, they're going to see all these deeds as mountains in front of them. And they'll be like, Alhamdulillah, I had something that I never got. <laughs> I mean, I had something in life that I never, there's something happened to me in life that I never got. On the your judgment, it will be mountains in front of you. That's how Allah says in the Quran about the battle of Badr, Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. Because if, if, if Tafsir always go to Nabi Muhammad's story, eh? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if Allah wanted to, Allah could send Jibreel to the disbelievers in Mecca and give one shout, and all of them did. That's how Allah has done with previous nations. He has done that. <laughs> right? But Jibreel doesn't get rewarded for doing that. There's no reward for Jibreel because he's an angel commanded. But when the Muslims fight in jihad, right, and in the, in the battle of, of Badr, there were angels that came down. But the angels were not allowed to strike any disbeliever until a Muslim human being raises his hand against a disbeliever. Then the angels can strike. Which means reward goes to who? The human being. Because it's not that Allah wants to just destroy people like that. Allah wants to elevate the position of certain human beings. And Allah wants to uh, forgive the sins of human beings. Allah wants to reward you on the judgment. So all these things have come your way. Right? Difficulty comes your way. Uh, if you, otherwise, you just get things for free, then you get nothing on the judgment. Then we said, can 50 years of life here, for 60 years of life here. And then, like, if everything just comes your way, no difficulty, no trial, then the judgment how? Right. Nothing to show, no work done. You know, mashallah. Subhanallah.
Right, so, walakinna akthar al-nasi la ya'lamun. Right, so, most human beings are oblivious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These, they take to be everything and keep going after them all the time. Right, the things, the, 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 the asbab, the, the means, the means behind things, they run after and they neglect, they neglect calling unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever you want in life, whatever you're going through in life, the first, the first option, and it will be always be the option is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Run to Allah and dua to Allah. It's not like you know you try everything, then I dua. No, you dua, you dua, you dua all the way. Subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They forget the causal of causes and the holder of absolute power. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I be dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this keeps a person by Allah's door, knocking on his door. And asking Allah to keep me there, keep me by your door, Ya Allah. Keep me by your door, knocking. And don't let me. This is why the calamity of luxury is a greater calamity than <laughs> the calamity of ease. They're all calamities because the whole, the, your whole life on this earth is calamity. As long as you're walking on this earth, it's going to be one calamity after another. Right? But either it's a calamity that, is, um, that has to do with difficulty or a calamity that has to do with ease. And the calamity of ease is more difficult. Because to, to wake up for tahajjud when you have everything all going well. <laughs> I mean, you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But if you've been doing it for something, right, for example, if you're waking up for tahajjud, I remember when I was in secondary school, I would wake up for tahajjud to, to do'a for A for my Malay. Because you don't get A for Malay. Because <laughs> you can drop my school, it allows to drop Malay if you get A for the gym paper. <laughs> so I just remember, like, for one month in. In, in May, every single night, I, I wake up, I set four, set four. Pray to Raka'as, Ya Allah, A, A1 or A2? A1, kind, so, so petty. <laughs> and then, the dapat the A2, I got A2 on Malay, then stop, stop my tajud. I still remember, nak dapat A2 je. Right, just, just, just for me to drop my Malay. <laughs> that's what the year. Right, so petty, but, but mashallah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that, that, that's, that does bring you to a realization. <laughs> you want being so you to do I, Ya Allah, I want this, Ya Allah, I want that job, Ya Allah, I want, I want, I want, I want. You got it? Continue, Anna. <laughs> continue, do I, Anna. Continue waking up, Anna. Continue with your crying, Anna. Continue, Anna. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So the calamity of ease is more difficult. Because you're in ease. What are you asking for? No, MashaAllah. A lot to ask for, dear judgment. <laughs> MashaAllah. Right, and Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ right, Which means, and they do not wish, accept, or do not want, accept whatever Allah has wanted, the Lord of the world. Right, you will never, you will never uh, gain as, uh, except what Allah himself has wanted. If I'm not wrong, this is in Surah Insan. Okay. Eh? Is it? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I know it's in the 29th juice or 30th juice. Somewhere there. Yes, one of those juice. I want to share. Una illa ayyasha Allahu Rabbul Alamin. You can search lah. You can search the, the I write the, the Arabic. Looks like this. How to write? Okay, never mind. When I'm on my Zoom, they can write. <laughs> but here I don't know how to write. Okay. Um, let's see if I get the ayat, I will send the ayat. Uh, people think others cause nobility and this debasement. They think human beings cause the nobility and this debasement causes advancement and regress, life and death. It is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who causes everything. And Allah says, Qulillahumma malika al-mulk Allahumma malika al-mulk tu'ti al-mulk man tasha'u wa tu'az man tasha'u wa tu'zillu man tasha'u wa bilika al-khayr inaka ala kulli shayin qadir tu'ud al-layla fi al-nahari wa tu'ud al-nahari fi al-layla wa tu'khir al-hayya min al-mayti wa tu'khir al-mayta min al-hayya wa tu'azuku man tasha'u bi qari hisab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Oh Allah Allah says in the Quran Say Allah the king of all kingdoms The king of all kingdoms Right And you give whomsoever you want, and you take from whomsoever you want, and you raise whomsoever you want, and you debate whomsoever you want. You do whatever you want to. You, you do whatever you want to do. You are the one who brings the day and you bring the night. If Allah wants to stop the day, nobody can bring the night. 
You can't say the Earth is on a rotation, you know, with, with inertia, <laughs> and it has, you know, that it's going to keep rotating. If Allah wants to stop the day, Allah stops the day. Right? And there are narrations of prophets that have stopped the sun, <laughs> making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and point to the sun, the sun stopped. Right? And then they did their work, previous prophets, eh? and then the sun set <laughs> after that. You know, mashallah, I mean, it's all not mustahil. Allah can do whatever He wants to do. <laughs> mashallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Naam. Okay, then he says, وَلَمَّا بَلَّغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And so Allah says, and when he reached maturity, we gave him wisdom, حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا and knowledge. And like that, we reward those who do good. And muhsinin, those who are excellent in goodness. He reaches prime. We gave him wisdom and knowledge. And thus, we reward those who do good. So, Nabi Yusuf prime age. What is his, what is his prime age? His prime age is, uh, some say 15, uh, puberty, 15. Prophets don't get wet dreams. Right? So, prophets only reach puberty by uh, age. <laughs> they reach puberty by age. They don't get wet dreams. And prophets don't have a, lust, a lustful nature like how other human beings have. And so if you go into the Akidah of prophets, they are, they, they, they are different. Eh? <laughs> Very different. Right? So when they, so when they marry, they marry for da'wah. Their whole life is about da'wah. Their whole life is about da'wah. So for some, for some wives, right, every single wife, there was a da'wah reason why he married her. Every single one of them, eh? subhanAllah. This is why at the, at the beginning of his, of his life, he only married one. <laughs> Sayyidah Khadija. And for how many years? 25 years. 25 years monogamous. 10 years. A bit more, 12 years. 10, 10 12 years uh, polygamous. And then they're, they're so hot on that. 25 years monogamous, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, he only married Sayyidah Khadija, a woman. Much older than him, but he's hopping on Sayyidina Aisha, Sayyidina Aisha. Because Sayyidina Aisha. Like she, Amram Buti says, they keep hopping on her. Ask her lah, she's happy and not married to Rasulullah. <laughs> she's very happy <laughs> being married to him. Then why are you all kepo or his you know, her, her marriage life? She was more than happy to be married. In fact, she was jealous whenever he had another wife. Right? So he, and, but it was all, um, it was all, it wasn't even political. It was da'wah. It was purely da'wah reason. And why he made each of them? So in Aisha, it was it was it was um, co- uh, it was commanded because of her intellect. As a very sharp woman, and by her, two thirds of knowledge come to us. Two thirds of it's a lot of Islamic knowledge in the young girl. <laughs> Mashallah, Subhanallah. I so um, prophets reach puberty by age, at right, fifteen. And right, so some say age of puberty. Some put at 33, at uh, the prime age 33, Nabi Isa was raised to the heavens at the age of 33. Uh, so Nabi Isa will come back down at the age of 33. Uh, so Allah preserves his age. Uh, and so when he comes back down, he's 33. Uh, um, others say at 20 or 40. Uh, and, and it is known, inshallah, eh, wisdom and knowledge comes to human beings with, this, with, with age. Inshallah, it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen. <laughs> wisdom and knowledge should come with age. Because experience, she comes with experience, she gets more and more wise. Right? But then unfortunately, there are human beings who don't <laughs> get more and more wise. You know, and, and it's really, um, there, is, there are different aspects of the human being when it comes to, when it comes to awakeness. Right? So from a child right, at two years old, right, from zero to two, right, they become awakened to their nafsu. Very much awakened to their nafsu. But their aqal haven't awakened yet. They're not mumayis. So when you handle a two-year-old or a three-year-old, you're handling a ball of nafs. Nafsu, 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 nafsu makan, nafsu eating, nafsu playing, nafsu fighting, nafsu, all kinds of nafsu right, that, that, is, that a child will, will have. Right? But the akal not there. <laughs> the akal, no akal to control the nafsu. So you're, so you're trying to reason with a three-year-old. Try that reason. <laughs> with a three-year-old, it's through throwing, throwing a tantrum. Try and reason. They can't, they can't, they can't. <laughs> Because the, the akal not there yet. The akal cannot grasp. You say to them, you know, don't, the, more you, the more you scream, the more I will not give it to you. The more they will scream at you. And I say, no, do you see the link or not? Do you see the link? <laughs> you don't scream, I give. You scream, I don't give. They scream. 
Nah, ini tak ada link. InsyaAllah. <laughs> Because they can't. They can't. And then when they reach five, six, seven, then the aql begins, begins to, to, to shine on them. The mind begins to grow. So you reach the age of discernment, tamiz. And then at this age, you find them being shy about their privates. Right? Prior to this age, you don't care. Run around, no clothes. <laughs> right? But it comes a point whereby mother cannot see. Right? Uh, don't look at me. Uh, they, they, straight away, where did they learn that? Uh, to, don't, don't look, don't look. Uh, they cannot be shy. Right? Shyness, that is, as, 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 as some of the, as Imam Ghazali says, uh, it is a, it's a nur, it's a light of the mind that Allah gives them that they learn to be shy. Now, human beings in that, human beings naturally are shy about especially about the private parts. And, but it's only society that conditioned them to not be shy about it. Naturally Allah gives shyness. Society destroys it right, for them. So if you can preserve it for them, that is good. Preserve the, the, the shyness that they have. And then as they grow older, right, comes the the so up to up to the mind, then it, the mind continues to grow until puberty. Then comes sexual awakening. Uh, they become more aware. Uh, for some people as young as nine, they <laughs> come to puberty already. And then some people as late as uh, 15, uh, they come to puberty. And then after that, there is an awakening of, uh, of wisdom. Uh, so most people by 40, they should reach there. <laughs> they should reach um, the wisdom. Why? The awakening of wisdom. And inshallah, inshallah, I'm not 40 yet, so. <laughs> inshallah, don't wonder how that will be. Eh? 40 by, by Hijri calendar. Eh? Don't, don't aim your, your Gregorian birthday, your, your Hijri birthday. When's your Hijri birthday? <laughs> Think, I'm not my Hijri birthday. <laughs> when is it? My husband last year, he, he was like, I'm turning, this, this is, I'm turning, I'm turning 40 in, in February. Then I say, 14, your Masihi, your Hijri was last year. <laughs> he was like, eh? Really? Yeah, you were 40 last year. <laughs> then he was like, Alamak, they were like 40 already. <laughs> he was trying to aim something lah for, for by, by, by 40 must be like this. You know, this ibadah lah, you're trying to aim something. Right, but basically by, by 40, say by 40 you should have realized. <laughs> your sada, eh? You have, must, must have realized by 40, by 40, realize your position in this world and your preparation for the hereafter right, at 40. Because 40 is downhill already. 40 is a peak for most human beings. And after 40, it's <laughs> downhill until, until the grave. Lah. Inshallah. I don't know how many, here, how many of you are 40 and above. Eh? <laughs> but it's 40. It's 40 already. <laughs> More years to 40. Alhamdulillah. My other said 20 or 40, which is why prophethood cut, uh, would come to most prophets at 40. Because 40 is when the full maturing of a human being, spiritual and by wisdom, intellectual and physical, full mature, they, they reach their prime at 40, most human beings. There are prophets that get it younger, right? like Nabi uh, Isa. Nabi Isa got it younger, right? in his, in his, uh, before 30, in fact. Um, Nabi Yahya. Nabi Yahya also got it younger. Right? But because Nabi Isa and Nabi Yahya, they were born in a time where there were no prophets. <laughs> Nabi Zakaria passed away. And Nabi Zakaria doa for child. Nabi Zakaria was going very old, no child. No inheritor to guide the Bani Israel. So he doa for a child. And so Allah gave him uh, Nabi Yahya. And so Nabi Yahya was given prophet, prophet, prophethood from a very young age. So uh, expected to carry <laughs> the message. But most prophets later, they are given at, at, uh, at a later age. Atainahu hukman wa ilma. Hukum implies wisdom, understanding, uh, intellect and power of judgment and ilm, knowledge is an awareness and knowledge both religious and worldly without ignorance. Nabi Yusuf was aware. Which is why Nabi Yusuf could handle the stores of the earth. Uh, he, he, had, he had knowledge. So he said, Ana hafizun I, I, am, I am one who guards over the wealth and I am knowledgeable about these affairs. I know how to guard over the wealth. Uh, so he has some financial uh, background, eh, Nabi Yusuf. He learnt, you know, about, about whatever he learned, eh, but he, had, he had some um, uh, background on how to handle finances. Uh, he was blessed with nubuwa, which is prophethood. Hikma meaning being able to control himself. A wise person is a person in control of his emotions. 
that's the, 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 that is the definition of a wise person. <laughs> a wise person is not a slave to his own desires. Whatever the desires might be, whether it is um, for his own ego, whether it's for sexual desires, whether it's food desires, whether it's sleep desire, whether it's, you know, our shahwa is from every angle. Eh? <laughs> the shahwa comes from every angle. So a wise person, like for example, a wise person, right, uh, uh, sees, you know, some, so for example, a wise person knows the reward of night prayer. Wise person, right? So will they wake up for night prayers? Yes. To us are accepted. A foolish person sleeps right through. Right? Doesn't care to wake up. Right? But you see, you know, which is why, like, like for example, if someone were to say, you know, you send salawat to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah sends you ten. To someone who refuses to send salawat to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you're a foolish person. Such a fool. Because to say, Allahumma sorry, I say, Muhammad, ten from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the child understands that that, that, that is a good thing. <laughs> say one time, ten come to you. You don't have to go somewhere and build a masjid and put money and put and, 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 and time, whatever. Just slawat. Slawat. <laughs> and all you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person is able to choose, a person of wisdom, able to choose what is correct, able to control himself. You see, when someone says, but it's obvious, Right? To wake up in the night is good for you. But why don't people do it? Because the nurse wants to sleep. The nurse wants to get up. <laughs> the nurse finds it so hard to get up and wudu and then pray a few rakaans. The nurse says, Subo E6. You know, Subo what time? 5.37, I think. <laughs> right? The nurse, nurse cries out. Subo, Subo ends at 6.59. <laughs> Now the nurse will talk to you, will talk to you, and the nurse will say, No, it's Sunna, it's not Wajib. Tak payah. <laughs> Especially if you're in a cold country. Eh? It's so cold, don't get up. <laughs> That's why Allah. Right, but the, the, the wisdom says, You're going to regret it. You're going to regret not getting up. Right? You only have a few more years of your life. Right? When are you going you, you, you gonna, to gonna keep wasting your mornings away? Right? Come on, get up, get up. Right. So, so the one with wisdom can push themselves. Get up, get up, get up, come. Bismillah, bismillah. <laughs> right, get up, mashallah. Right, here we see that maturity comes with knowledge. Also, some concept can only be understood with maturity. And with age comes experience, as Allah himself tells us. Right, to have age is important. So all prophets are given prophethood, most prophets, in fact, are given prophethood at a later age. And they are established in society. Right, so 40 is not too young, nor too old. It's just nice. If you're in your 30s, high chances you're not going to be a leader over the elders. If you're in your 40s, it's a chance. Right, because, you know, 40, you're kind, of, you're kind of senior. You're kind of senior. So those who are older than you will still, you know, uh, respect you and hold you in, in, you know, in regard. But if you're 30 coming in, right, can you imagine that you know, someone that's 30 years old, 30 years old, and saying, I'm the leader over everybody? Right? Most people will be like, or those who are older, lah, they'll be like, you're so small, so young, like 30 years old. It still sounds young, 30. Right? But 40 sounds mature. There's a maturity to it, inshallah. Okay. Physical maturity, intellectual maturity, emotional maturity, and spiritual maturity, as I mentioned, that all human beings go through this. But not doesn't go through all. Some people never reach their, their, their spiritual maturity. I mean, Allah help us. Eh? <laughs> right. So I want to give the definition for all of them. Physical maturity, as we know, right, um, is balir. Uh, okay? Physical maturity, puberty. Right. So the human being has grown into a full human being. Right. So now all of your body parts are functional. Whereas prior to puberty, uh, there are parts of your body that have not reached its full function. Intellectual maturity, mm. intellectual maturity actually they say it begins at tamiz, at, at the age of five, at around five to seven, where you begin to understand and learn things. Right? Mm. But with, um, with, with age, right, the mind begins to learn how to memorize, the mind begins to learn how to analyze, the mind begins to learn how to be critical about things. And when you teach children, you realize. When you teach primary one, primary two, or kindergarten, 
they cannot understand some concepts. You try your hardest to explain to them some concepts, they cannot. But with age, just a few of years, and they're now upper primary, they can understand already. Just have to mention to them one time, and they get it. Right? It's really, it's really about, about the age. And sometimes, sometimes you know, it is what, what is in modern day education, um, you know, all the, uh, all the, apa, the theories, lah, which actually is, is based on, in, in, the, in, the, in the prophetic method as well. Right? That when it comes for ch- to children, the first seven years is focus on character, character building. First seven years, akhlaq. After seven, when most, especially for boys, when their minds are ready to sit down at a desk and to write and to read and to memorize, even my memory comes earlier, but to write and to read, then you put them at a desk and they begin to do desk work right, all the way till they grow older. Right, but, but what has happened to society is that because you force them on desk work very early, that character building is not emphasized. Not for all, but, for, but, but, but it's growing. Lah. It's growing. Character building is neglected. And in Islam, character building is attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First seven years, Aqidah. It's Aqidah all the way, first seven years. Like connection to Allah, fear of Allah, Allah watches you, Allah sees you, run to Allah, cry to Allah, love Allah, love the Prophet, and follow the Prophet. First seven years, there only. Talk about that. Then when seven comes, pray. They will pray. Because the first seven years, full building of their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They love all that has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And pray is easy, inshallah, inshallah, easy <laughs> for them. Then by the time nine comes, I fully able to take on the sharia. Because Islam co- uh, requires for them to be ready by nine. Eh? <laughs> and it's, it's, because can balik anytime, <laughs> and nine onwards, anytime can balik. So even a boy, and I know a boy who balik at ten years old. Balik, ten years old. Four, twenty four, balik ready. <laughs> Subhanallah. If he has to be ready at that point because the, the, the angels start writing <laughs> all the scenes. Subhanallah. Right, so, intellectual maturity. Right, so, Allah, and Allah alam. You know, Allah alam. Right, but this is what my, my own experience like, in teaching children right, is that if you just give them, but I think what is our society pushes them right, into all of these things. So, that they're forced, especially for the boys. I don't know if any of you teach children or not, but for boys, they. Sometimes boys late, later on they bloom <laughs> and then they then they can really do it. Uh, but then at the beginning when the ground was um playful lah, eh? <laughs> running around still. Uh, and and they're boys. They're boys. I think I had a full primary one boys class and a full primary one girls class. Com- two different worlds. They're both in the same syllabus, but two different worlds going on. And my method for each of them different. I have to. I can't apply what I do with the girls to the boys. I cannot. Because the boys are the boys are the boys. <laughs> and Allah Allah, maybe it's something that Allah has I'm sure it's something that Allah has put in the genetics right, of the different genders. And there's a hit mind that Allah Allah. Eh? So it's not I, I split them at first because of Sharia, because I want them to not be mixing too much with each other. Right? But then uh, after I realized that it's actually an intellectual split. <laughs> because the boys have a different way of um, they all must they all must get up. <laughs> must get out and mind game and, and do all kinds of things. The girls, I can actually make them sit down and I write down a few words on the board and I'm going to test them on it. <laughs> so, Allah. But the boys, uh, different story. <laughs> Inshallah. Um, emotional maturity. Also, some human beings reach it, some human beings don't reach it. Now, what is emotional maturity? Emotional maturity is to know. Do not let the dunya into your heart. That is emotional maturity. So difficult. <laughs> so difficult. Dunya includes what? Things, position, reputation, people. And this is dunya. Eh? Right. Cannot get it into your heart. Get it up, get it up, get it up. <laughs> Subhanallah. And one of our teachers said that, you know, why, why do you have people in your heart who are bothering you, hurting you? You know, uh, weighing you down. Have Allah and the Prophet وسلم, in your heart. That is emotional maturity because it will drive you to only doing things that will please Allah and His Prophet with regards to these people in spite of yourself. 
because emotional maturity. Because if you can, if you can, if you're able, if you realize that you, you know, um, being involved in a certain situation is hurting the situation, if you can see it, eh, you can see it's hurting someone's akira, is hurting someone's, you know, um, uh, uh, ibadah. Being mature means to be able to, to, to accept distance, to be mature. And to do art for them and to hope that somebody else can bring them. Because sometimes, sometimes some people they are you do have, you don't you don't want to, but it's possible. It's possible. Like that one 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 story that I was with my mother also with my mother about this morning. But it's not Islamic, but it's a it's a story to learn from, right? Helen Keller. Like Helen Keller, if you go to her biography, her parents were hurting her, dev- her development. Her parents were hurting her development. Because they couldn't stand to see her frustrated, she can't see. She can't hear, right? she can't speak, right? she was deaf, dumb and blind. Right? So the parents couldn't tahan to see her in that kind of frustrated situation. Right? So they, they kept giving her, giving her, giving her, giving her, giving her, which made her into a, a monster. Lah. I spoiled. So when they got a teacher in, the teacher was trying to train her. And you can find it on, online, lah. This, this name in the movie about it, the, the, the miracle worker. Not that you know, <laughs> but it's a good, it's a good one of the, one of those good, good, those, one of those good movies, and whereby um, the teacher comes in, and the teacher tries to train her, and tries to teach her, but the parents keep undoing it. So she tries to do something with her, the parents come in and undo it, you know, and if there's something else, parents come in and undo it. And so eventually, the teacher they say to the parents, "I'm going to bring her to a shed. She's going to live with me, like in the, in the cottage, lah, cottage or shed." Leave me with me there, far away from the two of you. Because you are hurting her development. And the parents understood because they cannot, they cannot die seeing the, the, the girl so frustrated. And true enough, when she was separated from her parents, she began to learn. Because the teacher had this. <laughs> teacher, but eventually, in her own memoir, she wrote a lot of um, gratitude towards the teacher for forcing her right, to be civilized and to, to behave and to, and to learn, to study. And she, she, she appreciates her teacher, you know, inshallah. So it's like emotional maturity does come to a point whereby you realize that you being involved in the matter right, is not helping it. Sometimes you realize that you're hurting the people in there just by you being there. Right, so you need to pull out. It happens. And I'm sure you've gone through enough of life to know that it happens right, in life. But by you being there, it's just making things worse. <laughs> right, so you just emotional maturity and do off do from a distance. Don't ask from a distance. And then spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is to do all that you do in life only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's spiritual maturity. And everything that happens to you in life is directed only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to see that. And so spiritual maturity is a very high position because nothing can shake you now. No matter what afflicts you, death, Loss of job, lot uh, sickness, illness, whatever. And Nabi Ayub, and Nabi Ayub is the is his our 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 our, <laughs> our case study of spiritual maturity. All kinds of things shatan did to him, right? But what focus on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Focus on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Of course, our Prophet Muhammad Alaihi Wasallam is the is the, is the, is has excelled in all of this. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, subhanallah, so Nabi Yusuf here, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ And when he reached his maturity. So this is why we open up all the types of maturity. He reached physical maturity. He reached intellectual maturity. He reached emotional maturity. He reached spiritual maturity. Nabi Yusuf, alayhi salam. Hikmah is to hold the self from lower desires. And Nabi Yusuf is about to face this. So Allah gave him wisdom and Allah gave him spiritual maturity, which is why in the following ayats Allah says He saw Allah's proofs. He saw it. Right? So He has been given spiritual maturity. So when a woman comes up to Him, He's able to uh, uh, block her right, from Him because He sees Akhira. He sees hell. He sees heaven, and He sees this woman coming with hell, and so He runs away right, from her. Alayhi salam. Allah, Allah give us maturity, inshallah. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. In that day, I was going through a course uh, because of this, this, to go through with movies and everything la, on marriage because to help people. Because I mean, it's, 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 it's a rising issue la, in our society of, 
or broken marriages and all kinds of stuff, right? And which, 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 like, according to the six in Singapore, the 10 years ago, the leading cause of broken marriages, as in, in a, according to women, right, would be finances, according to men, um, is infidelity. It means men find their wives not uh, loyal. Now, on both ends, men and women, it is infidelity. Both ends. The leading cause of divorces. But of course, that will bring back to neglect. Lah. Oh, Allah Alam. But I was, I, was, I was going to the concert, my husband was with me. And I was like, at the end of the day, pun taqwa. Okay. I mean, as much as someone's not fulfilling your needs, taqwa, taqwa. Right? Taqwa is taqwa. And you cannot blame someone for not fulfilling your needs, therefore you go and cheat. Okay. Right? I mean, can't say that. That Allah has put bars on us. Like, control yourself. So even if you're not married, you can't say, oh, I'm not married, I have to find a way out. No, taqwa, taqwa. <laughs> the, the spiritual maturity. And I think the leading cause of, of a lot of problems right, in society, not just marriage, but problems, right, is maturity. I think the leading cause of all problems. Maturity, people are still in their childish uh, mentalities. Right? Still shallow, still dunyawi. Still uh, material. They're not looking beyond all these things. <laughs> and it's more important. So the Sahaba could do what they could do because the Sahaba had no concern about dunya. So when you have no concern about dunya and all you care about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a 17 year old who can lead an army and, and, and conquer lands because they had no care for the dunya <laughs> at all. They were all mature. You don't hear anything about Sahabas fighting each other in, in that way. Later on, you hear about the hypocrites doing it. And but the Sahaba actually never fought Sahaba. Sahaba never fought Sahaba. And it was the hypocrites who caused all kinds of you know, uh, problems between, between companions. But the companions were so mature. They, they were so much, subhanAllah. But in our society now, any organization are the politics. And then some there's some bickering and some backbiting and some all of this goes back down to lack of maturity. Lack of maturity in society. May Allah help us. All of us lah, all of us getting there, inshallah. Allah. His godly piety and excellence in deeds are reasons for these blessings. But it's hard to say in society when you say, You're all so immature. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard to, it's so it's these kind of words are very, very hurtful to see someone that you have no maturity. You're not, you're, not, you're not being mature about the situation. You're not analyzing the situation well. You're not looking at it you know, from, from benefit and, and harm. You're looking at it from self, self, self. When the self comes in, there's immaturity because that is how children uh, function. Self, self, self. Because right? you think of immaturity, you think of children. Right? How do they function, children? I want. Right? Give me mine. <laughs> some human beings, some adults at the old age. I want. <laughs> Give me mine. <laughs> Same talk until old age. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. May Allah help us. May Allah help us. All the muhsin, Allah will grant them wisdom and knowledge. The muhsin, someone who takes a better path, is patient, always goes above and beyond. This is a reward for whosoever excels in the obedience to Allah. The blessings were that the blessings Allah gave him. Allah said, just like that, we have rewarded those who do good. Allah established him in the land. Allah taught him interpretation of events and dreams. Allah gave him discernment and knowledge. And uh, so this are the three blessings that Allah gave him, gave him. May Allah grant us ihsan and make us of those who strive for excellence. So all these verses in between. See in Surah Nabi Yusuf, you have story, then you have reflection. And Allah gives a story, then Allah gives some ayats of reflection. Then Allah gives the other part of the story. Then reflect again. Then other part of the story. Then reflect again. And at the end of the whole surah, a whole page of reflection. So Allah walks us through the lesson. <laughs> Subhanallah. 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 It's not only two ayat. I haven't come to Zulaiha story yet. Inshallah. It's two ayat. Nabi Yusuf was called Karim bin Karim bin Karim. And the noble bin noble bin noble. Nabi Yusuf bin Nabi um, Yaqub 
بين نبي إسحاق بس هم كريم من فوق مو كريم فوق كريم بين نبي إبراهيم فوق كريم بن كريم بن كريم بن كريم من النوبل مان بين النوبل مان بين النوبل مان بين النوبل مان عيسى يوسف بن يعقوب بن إسحاق بن إبراهيم عليه السلام عليه السلام so Nabi Yusuf had taken from his forefathers how he will react to this Alright, so now comes the, uh, the verses, the one that was read in the in the, the, the competition. وَرَوَدَتْ وَالَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابَ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكَ so, so it says قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَسْوَاي إنه لا يفلح الظالمون. And she, in whose house he was, asked him, asked of him an evil act. Rawa, that means seduce. And she tried to make him want her. And she tried to so the word rawa literally means seduce. She tried to make him from the word arada yuridu to want. So rawa, that that means to want someone to want you. So seduce lah, seduce. So uh, to, to an evil act, she bolted the doors, the doors eh, that tells us that they were on the inner chambers. There were many doors in between, at, um, the outside of the palace and the inside. Right, but the Aziz had uh, access through all the doors, the Aziz, the minister. But he was out working. He actually came back at a time he was not usually home. So he caught them. He caught, I mean, he caught the situation. And the thing about it was that Nabi Yusuf, being a prophet, he would not have exposed Zulaikha for her evil deed had she not blamed him. Because it, it, it falls under backbiting. Right? So you see, if let's say what happened, happened, right? And she kept quiet. Right? And he just didn't say anything at all. Nothing happened. I see nothing happened. He would not have said anything at all. Because there was no need to expose her. Uh, he can just protect himself against her uh, in, in her house. So he can just, I mean, she, she can't overpower him. Uh, she can't overcome him. Right? So he can protect himself. He would have not have said anything to the Aziz had she not blamed him. Because she blamed him, now she exposed herself. Because now he has to defend himself. Right? But, but by right, you see, when it comes to backbiting, it's so sensitive. Backbiting, he couldn't even say what she did know. Because it happened behind closed doors. It's her sin. Right? There's no need to expose her. Correct? Think about it. Eh? It is, the scholar said, it's not, it's not from me, it's from the Tafsir. The scholar said it would have been backbiting right, if he just told the Aziz like that. Because she can repent from her sin. Right? But because she straight away said she blamed Nabi Yusuf, right? So now he has to defend himself. So he has to, 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 to fight back. And said that she's the one. Uh, so now he is exposing her. And then now comes who's who's correct. Then comes the witness. Right? There, were, there, were not, there would not have been a witness had there not been a, an initial blame. So she technically exposed her own self. <laughs> as, if the, as if the brothers and Abi Yusuf, they exposed their own selves. <laughs> and they brought the, the blood. <laughs> and if they had not brought, they didn't bring the blood on the shit, everything. Like nobody can falsify their lie. Correct? No proof to falsify. But because they go and happily bring the shit at the blind, <laughs> now we have proof you are liars. <laughs> now I've got proof. You bring your own proof. And so Zulaikha, same thing. The, her evil act, I mean, I mean you'll be surprised, lah, eh? but her evil act was actually her evil act. And by the Sharia, there is no need to talk about it at all. Because it's her evil act behind closed doors. So had Nabi Yusuf run off and escaped, right, and the Aziz didn't see, didn't see anything or whatsoever, it would have been kept a secret that she tried to do, but he ran away right, from her. And then from then on, he knew her to be vigilant of her. But because she <laughs> was compelled to blame him, and for all the Aziz didn't even see anything. Well, he was just by the door. And but she was so guilt, so guilt ridden that she had to say something. And she said, He is the one who tried to get to me. 
Why did I say what's going on? <laughs> then now he had to say, but she is the one. And now they had to call a witness. And now everything is exposed. Mashallah. I never, never, you know, when I was telling my teacher, explained this. The mashallah. Never, never realized that she actually exposed herself right, by, by blaming Nabi Yusuf under his salam. Right, so she says, um, she says, she says, so she locked all the doors. Meaning she had planned this. It's been in her mind for some time. Right? She said, come, hai talak, come. He said, I seek Allah's protection. He is my Lord who has treated me honorably. Uh, wrongdoers will never prosper. Right? So uh, my Lord here, right, the scholar say, it refers to the Aziz. Right? It refers to the Aziz. Right? Oh, my, my Lord, the Aziz, he has done good to me. Right? How could I disobey? How could I uh, betray him right, in this way? Rawadat Waradat Rawadat 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 To make someone slip towards their motive The woman of the house had made plans to cause him to slip She was determined to make him inclined to her wishes She is in the house all the time The husband is not home much So he used to deal with her all the time And someone being a servant eh? Being a servant at the um, at the back and call of your ma'am. Right? So the ma'am has evil intentions. Ignoring her command will not be easy for him, but it is easy for the one with taqwa, the abuse of taqwa. Allah highlights that, he, that because he is under her roof. Right? So Allah highlights that it's happening in her house and she is the, the, the ma'am of the house. Right? So it's, it's someone running away from their boss. And the boss wants to do evil, run away from the boss. And this happens so much in, 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 uh, in our time. Eh? And, uh, Allahu alam, Allahu alam. But I, for my students, I hear la, that, um, Allah, Allahu alam. Eh? <laughs> in some situations, sometimes bosses, they abuse their position with regards to uh, their workers. Yeah, so here, the boss is trying to abuse her position. Okay, inshallah, I will stop there for today, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة أن الله يرزقنا عن منافعا وعملا خاصا ويستعمل دلالة على الهدى ويسر به قابلنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم وإلى أرواح معنا من مشيخنا وزرت علينا وإلى حضرة نبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة